Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 12, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate you being here today. So what do we talk about? Well, I kind of got thrown for a loop with some technical difficulties this morning, but I did wake up thinking that I did want to talk about IPOs. And I went back and looked at an IPO presentation that I did over the summer. And one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is, one, there's still an IPO bull market going on, and it's not too late to get on board. So I thought it'd be timely to do another IPO update. And a lot of uh, what I'm going to cover, I actually covered earlier this summer. Earlier this summer, I guess it's fall now. But anyway, obviously we can talk about current market conditions and your questions on trading uh, if you don't mind keep the questions on the slides you can ask me anything you want but wait until we get to the charts or wait till the slides are done before asking questions in general and then also when we get to the charts and you want to ask about your favorite stock picks if you don't mind ask about one stock at a time and then hit enter and that way i make sure i get to everybody's picks you can ask about as many as you want i just want to know uh i just want to be able to know which ones are covered and which ones I haven't. As I said a minute ago, we're going to revisit IPOs today. And I'll explain why I use a little flaming fish. I guess before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, so this is going to be like IPOs revisited times two. One of the really cool things about IPOs is they either go up or they don't. They either work or they don't. And I was hitting the wrong guy here. <laughs> was it Will Rogers once said? Yeah, Will Rogers. He said, uh, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Well, obviously, he was being a little tongue-in-cheek. But with IPOs, you can almost do that. In fact, I have a pattern that pretty much just does that. And I'll show you another pattern in a few minutes, another setup, which is very similar to that. And one of the things that I found really interesting is that the significant new high or low is often set during the first week of trading and what's even more interesting is a lot of times the first day will set the tone for the IPO. Now you still want to wait at least a week. I get emails all the time. This uh, company's coming public. Hey Dave, Blue Apron's coming public. Should I buy a Blue Apron? No. <laughs> hey Dave, Chicken Soup for the Soul is coming public. Should I buy a Chicken Soup for the Soul? No. Well, when should I buy it? Well, wait a week, okay? Because you don't know how it's going to be perceived by the public. Now, when I did my IPO course, I didn't focus on what happens pre-IPO back here, but I did cover a lot of ground about what happens before it comes public. And the reason is because there's a lot of things that go on behind the scene. But all you have to worry about is what happens after it comes public. However, if they botch something back here, such as, as one thing that I talked about in the course, if the price too high, they're going to die, as you'll see here in a few seconds. Then you let that shake out in the market. And here's the good news. You only have to wait for five trading days. One, two, three four, five. And I have one pattern that could actually get you long on day five. In this video, I'm going to talk about a pattern that can get you long on day six. Now, one thing I was thinking about before I got started is this is what I call a pioneer type of pattern, meaning that you're getting in pretty early. Not to be confused with like a... Um, Well, Pioneer, not, I was thinking of uh, also the um, Phoenix pattern, but this is much different. 
All right, let's rewind that. <laughs> you have first, you have pioneer patterns, and then you have secondary patterns. Well, secondary pattern, there are some subtle differences from my core methodology, but a pioneer pattern is going to get you in way back here, and then the secondary patterns are going to look a lot like the core methodology. You might have a TKO, you might have a pullback. Now, there are quite a few caveats with those secondary patterns, and they're, they traded a little bit different than the core methodology, but for the most part, they're fairly close. You might get in on a somewhat shallower pullback. You might allow for a few more days. In other words, you're a little bit more lenient in these secondary patterns. But what we're talking about now is pioneer patterns. Now, this, the Dave Light, or whatever we're going to call this IPO pattern, we'll show you in a minute, does have some longer term characteristics too, which can kind of dovetail in with that secondary thing. But we'll get to that in just one second. And by the way, to those of you who haven't been to a single one of my IPO presentations, the reason I use the little sardine dates back to the old sardine story, and I'll try to sum that up as quickly as possible so your eyes don't glaze over for those who are here live. But the sardine story basically was sardines became very expensive, and, and there's variations of the story throughout the Internet, so poke around a little bit and pick whatever version you like the best. But sardines were being traded, and these little tins were becoming very valuable and becoming extremely expensive. And one guy decides, well, you know what, I'm going to have me a very expensive lunch. And so he opens up the sardines, and they were rotten. He contacts the guy who sold it to him and said, you silly fool, why did you eat those sardines? Those are for trading, not eating. So IPOs are for trading not eating and then I go into a lot more details on this but a lot of times they'll take off they'll fly and then they'll die that's probably the most common longer term pattern with IPOs the beauty is this fly portion could be very 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 significant it happened fairly quickly but unfortunately it eventually ends badly I'm in one now that might end badly and we might get to that if we have time but so what? You know, it's like I was like, wow, I gave up a lot of open profits on that. But I looked, it's like, well, shoot, so still going to make over 100 percent. So it's better than poke in the eye. But there's a great dichotomy. And, and that's something that's 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 gotten even better lately. It seems like they really either work or they really either don't. And as I said a second ago, part of the problem is with the ones that just come public and die, look like that, is they price too high and then they die. We'll take a look at a few of those in just one second. In fact, let's do that now. So here's some examples that I showed earlier this year. This is PK. You can see day one, and it never did take out that day one high. So what do we just say? Usually within the first five days of, tra of trading, you have a significant high or a significant low. So take a look at like UPL here, also day one, major high, then what happened? It actually imploded from there. Now here's one on day two. It looks like it was really off to the races, makes its high on day two, and then what happens? It implodes. Where'd my pen go? Here we go. Now, again, what did I just say? Five days, okay? So in this particular example, day one, day two, day three, day four, and then it never sees that high again. Now, Snapchat, obviously popular company, at least with the young folk. You can see that it looked like it was off to a pretty good start. Day one, day two, and then that was it. It crapped out. Now, I would never confuse the issue with facts, but maybe I'm becoming an old fart. Don't anybody chime in on that. But explain to me how a company that pukes rainbows, that allows you to put puking rainbows on your face and send them to your friends, can make money like that, doing that. So, now someday they might make money, but... I don't get it. 
Now, over the summer, we talked about deja vu all over again with Blue Apron because that was a highly anticipated and a lot of buzz going on as an IPO. And you could see that on day one, it hit its high. And then from then, it has obviously imploded. Take a look at SWCH. This is a more recent one. Notice that day one so far, it's hit its new high. So at the least, do not trade this IPO unless it can trade above the high. Of, let's say it was at 24 and a half or so. Here's another one. Very recent IPO. I just pulled this one this morning. Brand new high. When? Day one. And so far, it's imploded. Lost about half of its value. But here's the beauty of this, and I know I kind of beat the dead horse on this, and I'm going to keep beating the dead horse on this. No capital is put in harm's way by this one simple rule in and of itself. Wait at least five days, or at least to the close of day five, I should say, and take a Will Rogers approach and if they don't make, if they don't go up, don't buy them. Kind of out of it today. I want to, I keep wanting to say Roy White Rogers, <laughs> which would actually work better because if they don't trigger, buy them. But I guess trigger died. That doesn't make any sense. It's been a long morning. Now let's talk about a simple little system or setup, however you want to look at it, that will keep you out of trouble. And IPOs. I want to put the word often in there because nothing's perfect and nothing always works. But the thing about this is you avoid so many stinkers and you catch enough big winners to make it all worthwhile. Obviously, every now and then it doesn't work. But you make so much money on the big winners that it pays for it all. And you also, again, you move, you uh, avoid so many losing trades. I actually, in some cases, in some ways, lost money with my IPO course because people became so successful trading them that they, or at least in one particular case, they dropped off my core trading service. They're so like, Dave, I get it. This IPO thing's working great. I'm printing money. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. It won't always be this good. In fact, when I launched the course, I said, look, things are great. This was three years ago. Things are fantastic. They won't always be this good. But the good news is you get this knowledge now. And if this bull market continues, obviously, it's going to work out fantastic for you. But when, not in, it ends when the next one comes along, you're going to have this knowledge and do incredibly well. I think I was kind of nervous back then because things were doing so great with the IPOs that I thought it would stop. I thought it was in. It was due to come to end. And so far, it's just been phenomenal. So I would strongly encourage you to take a look at IPOs. Yeah, they're a little bit riskier. And this is something that I went into in a lot of detail in the course. And I don't remember all the quotes that I had in there, but it's kind of like, kind of like equates a ship in the harbor. You know, ships a lot more safer just sitting in the harbor, but that's not what they're built for. And then we get paid to take risks. We have to put capital in harm's way if we're ever to make any money. And we go into that in a lot of detail, obviously, in the psychology. And when we do that in the week of charts. So let's take a look at the rules. Let's take a look at some setups that I mentioned in the last presentation on this and then let's take a look at some current setups or recent setups I should say so the low of the stock must be above the five-day moving average when I a lot of my research comes from comes from when I'm trying to prove a point by making something as simple as possible. It's kind of interesting. You, We all go through this 
trader's journey, as I talk about quite often, where we started something simple and we add all this complexity to it. And then we peel away that complexity and we end up back at the start. So my research over the last decade or so has been, maybe even longer than that, has been to prove how simple things can work actually quite well. In fact, the whole concept of daylight dates back to 1995 when I did an article in Stocks and Commodities magazine where I showed a simple little system for trading Japanese yen. And that's where the term daylight came from. There was a gentleman that emailed me after the article, and he dubbed it daylight. And now in more recent times, we've been calling it Dave Light, which uh, was kind of – which somebody sent me an email on that. I'm kind of out of it today, so I forget I forget the uh, – who sent me the email, but I'll have that by next presentation. Now, the second rule – with one small caveat, is that it has to close at a new high. Doesn't it have to, doesn't have to close at an all-time high. It's to close at a new closing high, okay? With the caveat that if the new high is set on day one, and I'll show you plenty of examples. So if this is a new high and then it does this, that it not only has to close at a new high, but it also has to take out the high of day one. So let's say the close was here, and then on this day it closes here. That's a new closing high, but if it doesn't close above the high of day one, when that new high is set on day one, which often is the case, then it also has to close above that high. So here's an example. I wrote an article a while back, you can find it on my website, where you could see that here it closed at a new high and then the low was greater than the moving average. That's a whole system. And it's actually a buy on close system. So you do have to pay attention. Now, you don't have to watch the screen all day, but you do have to going in say, okay, this, this one's getting close. Looks like it could close at a new high. So you got to come in on the close, near the close, I should say, and you have to buy on the close. Now, I've done a lot of research for like the next open, and they, it does seem to show some promise, but ideally you want to get in on the close of that day. So it's like if you miss the trade in the close of that day, all, all hope is not lost. The next day it might be worthy of trading. So take a look at this stock here, and as you can see, on the first day of trading, it made a new high. So we have to take out that new high on a close, as we did here, and then there has to be also daylight. But right here, on this day here, there was a daylight. Let me just take this out. But if you squint your eyes really hard, you can see there is daylight, in other words, the moving average looks like that, and the low is right here. There's daylight, or as we call it in more recent times, Dave Light. Trying to figure out, trying to take a page out of the John Bollinger manual and put my name on something. My, my wife's been uh, after me to put my name on something for a long, long time. <laughs> I see bow ties, and all, I see my patterns all over the Internet, and, and a lot of times – or most of the times, I never get any credit for it. So at least with the Bollinger Band, Bollinger gets credit for it. And you actually buy on the close once that low is cleared. Okay, Howard says, how long we consider this trade? Three months, six months, or longer? You're getting ahead of me. I'll answer that question in about three slides. So let's take a look at another example. And this is an open trade. At least it was open a little while ago. I don't know if I got stopped out yet or not. But it's an open trade with a pattern I call buy at B. Now let's take a look at it. Day one, looks like it had a pretty good day. Day two, another good day. Day three came in a little bit. Day four and day five. So the new closing high was set on day five. Okay, 
So on day six, what happens? Well, we have daylight and it's above the moving average. So with the buy at B, you could actually be long at the close of day five. The reason I call it buy at B, when I'm giving the whole thing away, is if a market's going to go from A to C, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. And this is the whole basis of technical analysis. And if you watch the first four videos of trading full circle, which I'll give you the link in the end, I talk a lot about the fact that a market has to go through B to get to C. If B is greater than A and B is less than C. And that's why I call that to buy at B. The reason I included the moving average was is twofold actually. One is so the market shows a little bit of acceleration. It's pulling away from that moving average. And two, because the only way you could actually trade this pattern would be to have the five-day moving average on your chart, which is not going to be plotted until day six. So again, we have daylight, and then you actually buy on the close. Now, you don't have to watch the screen all day. You only have to come in near the close and see what happens. And as I said earlier, with the buy at B and the daylight, Dave Light pattern, IPO Dave Light, Dave Landry's IPO Daylight pattern, how's that? The new, the next open does show promise too. So if you miss the trade, the next open might make it worthwhile. The only problem with the next open is obviously if the market just keeps on going, you, you could get in much higher. The second problem is it could, from a psychological standpoint, put you in a position of making additional decisions. So let's say it opens a point lower the next day. Now what do you do? Do you get in even though it's lower? What if it opens, it starts dropping a little bit before you get in? So it forces you to make additional decision so you're going to have to have some additional rules they don't have to be extremely rigid but you will have to have some additional discretionary type of rules that you're going to in interact as opposed to the dave light system the rules are fairly strict you buy actually on the close now there are a few little caveats that i haven't completely fleshed out and it's kind of the same thing with the buy at B is that you want you do want to have a little bit of range in the IPO. You don't want to have an IPO come public, have a very narrow range. So you don't want to have it come public, do this. And this is a really tight range over the first four or five days. You want it to show that it has some promise or some excitement, maybe run up big or run down big, whatever the case may be. But you want to show that it's it's there's some excitement behind it and it just doesn't come public and flatline. If it does flatline like this, then you're better off waiting for one of these secondary type of patterns. But in this particular case, and I don't know what this low is down here, but you can see this was like about a 50% run. I'm just eyeballing it round numbers, maybe even more within the first week or so of trading. So this certainly qualifies as something with a decent range. Now, Howard's asking, how long will you consider this trade? Three months, six months, or longer? Well, there's some interesting long-term promise here. And it usually takes me a while to incorporate something into my trading. And I've been watching these longer-term moves happen. And I think that it's definitely worthwhile trading them much longer term so ferrari which was a dog on day one look at that like a year later did a buy at b so i think that these relatively new ipos within a year or so what i call a toddler because they're still fairly new to the market are worth trading from two aspects or actually three but first with this ipo dave light pattern 
which has a bit of a breakout characteristic. Now, if you've known me over the last 20-something years, you know that I'm Mr. Pullback player. I remember 1999, some guy pulled me aside. That pullback thing you invented put my daughter through college. I'm like, hey, I didn't invent the pullback. You know, I just, I just realized it's probably a good way to trade. So for the most part, I am a huge fan of pullbacks, and that's probably 99% of what I do. But there is a breakout characteristic in these IPOs. And yes, this Dave Light pattern with IPOs does show longer term promise. And I think it's worth looking at the longer term aspects of it, at least a year or so. So getting back to Howard's question or continuing along the line of Howard's question. Boy, I put these slides together quick, huh? <laughs> now you just got a little ahead of me. Uh, notice that this stock comes public. Day one forms its high, tries to rally a little bit, but then pretty much dies out from there. So according to the rule one, with the caveat of if the day one is the high for the first week of trading, the first five trading days, then it also has to close above that high in addition to be a new high close. And it's kind of hard to see, but there is actually, there's a few new high closes in here. In fact, and this is something I don't want to flesh out too. This is a little bit more advanced, but let's say this is day one. And we say, okay, well, it's got to get above that high. One, two, three, four, five. Let's say the new closing high for the first week is right here, but the high is set on day one. So what's our rule? We not only have to close at a new closing high, which would be right here, we also have to close above the prior high, which would also be here. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. The second rule is the price also has to be above the moving average. So let's say it closes here but it doesn't close above the moving average. So now we have a new closing high. So this resets itself to where this is the high that has to be taken out now. So hopefully that made sense. So you could see on this day here, let me erase all this. On this day here, it made a new closing high. Now that's another pattern, but it's not technically a Dave Light IPO until this particular day here. And it also, we forget about this day now because it resets itself to this new closing high is the one we're looking at. Okay, does that make sense? It still has to be a new closing high. And if the, the original high was made on day one, all-time high was made on day one, it also has to take that out. But let's say a close takes out that all-time high but your moving average isn't, you don't have Dave Light, then you wait until you have Dave Light and a close above. So here's another case. You can see day one looked like the stock was off to the races. Okay, if you didn't buy it on the open, you're probably thinking, boy, am I screwed. Look at this thing, already up a couple of bucks. Maybe I should just jump right in. No, no. Give it a week. See what happens. And you could see that took a couple of months, but notice that it did pop above the moving average, a little acceleration higher, and then it closed at an all-time high, which also took out the day one high and also took out the new closing high, which was reset on this day here. So again, you buy into close in a situation like that. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that money management is crucial. And I kind of beat the dead horse on that in the IPO course because you're, you're trading an instrument that is a little riskier. We don't know how it's going to behave in actual markets. Whereas if you are looking at a stock that's been around for five or 10 years, we know how it behaves. We have a good idea. We know that it trades persistently. We know that it chops around. And we should avoid it. We know that it's accelerating higher in addition to persistent move that we maybe we want to be in this stock because it's a good looking stock. 
You don't have all that with IPOs. But the beauty of it is, and this is why I called the course the promise of the future, is they trade off a promise. And again, a lot of times you have that fly and die because everybody's so excited about it. Everybody rushes in and that promise may not materialize and then they implode. And that's why, as I preach throughout the course, you have to have a chair ready for when the music stops. IPOs really aren't risky if you understand what you're getting into. The reward is really worth it, just like I make the case quite often for trading more volatile stocks. And if you go in and dig through my YouTubes, if you can stay up at night, just don't operate heavy machinery afterwards, <laughs> you'll see where I actually prove that trading more risky stocks is less volatile because when you're taking that money management system into account, you're trading fewer shares and more volatile stocks. And it's kind of like you're better off knowing it's, it's the devil you know type of situation. And if you look at the free reports on my website, if it ever comes back up, <laughs> DaveLander.com slash free reports, you'll see that I do have a report where I talked about trading more volatile stocks and more inefficient type of markets. And that's what we're looking to capitalize on is an inefficiency. And that's the beauty. It's like, yes, I will trade more efficient markets like Forex and now Bitcoin. But your biggest opportunities are going to be in your more inefficient markets. And IPOs certainly qualify. But again, just know not to beat the dead horse, which I've never been accused of. <laughs> it drives my wife nuts. Short trip. Is that an, what is that an outside thought? Thank God she didn't come to my shows, huh? All right, here's a case where day five is right here. And then it did close at a new closing high on day six. But the low wasn't greater than the, than the um, moving average. There was no Dave Light. But you can see here, clearly you have Dave Light. So it would be a buy on the close. Now, I keep mentioning the course, the promise of the future. This is the URL for that, daylander.com slash IPOs. And once I work out a couple technical difficulties, I had a certificate expire today. I wasn't aware you had to renew them. So I had an SSL certificate to expire. So that's why the site is down now. I'm just waiting for the DNS to propagate. Uh, I'll put that on sale once the website gets back up. And so maybe look for that tomorrow, October 13th, and check it out. And it's like I want to, I guess I'm kind of feeling, well, obviously I'd make money if you buy it, but I, I kind of feel like, and I'm not altruistic, believe me, but I kind of feel like there's a lot of good knowledge in IPOs and there's a bull market right now, and you need to know about it. Just don't quit my core trading service if you become extremely successful <laughs> with IPOs. And I will give you, uh, I do have unlimited lifetime support in the course. And also, as you guys have found out with the trading service, I, I do give you guys precedent when it comes to questions and all. And I've been helping quite a few of you guys with IPOs. But if you become too successful with that, don't, don't quit the core service because longer term, you're still going to need that. You still need a broad methodology, but the beauty of the IPOs is we're in an IPO bull market. The other beauty of IPOs, and stuff that I went into a lot of detail, is that they can be self-regulating. So if you're newer to trading, and it sounds, you know, people would say, like, oh, I can't believe that crazy Dave Landry is telling people new to trading and trade IPOs. Like, well, hear me out. IPOs are self-regulating. So what's going to happen is when a bear market, not if, when a bear market comes out, comes around, less and less or fewer and fewer companies will come public. And the reason is because conditions aren't conducive for them raising capital. So they're going to sit on their hands. They're actually going to do the timing for you. And they're going to come public when the market is doing what? Going up. What did uh, Linda Rasky used to say? Feed the ducks while they're quacking. Well, that's kind of the, the idea of what they're going to do with IPOs. And that's why I'm telling people 
that don't abandon everything else and just trade IPOs. Make sure you have a broad methodology based on trend following so you're catching cycles over the years and energies and biotechs and all these other areas that are firmly established. And then also on the short side, when the market does go down, we obviously will short the market. Not going to get rich shorting the market, but something that we also do to stay afloat. All right. I mentioned the Trading Full Circle course. Uh, you can check out the videos for free, first four videos at least. And I actually got a couple of emails from people who, who didn't know me. I'm like, you know, Dave, I've never actually seen someone actually teach something in the, in the first uh, teaser video, so to speak. It's like, no, I want you to get a feel for what I'm doing and how I do it and understand it. And, and if I could teach as much as I could teach you as possible, better off I am. Because you think, okay, well, if you show me all this, what else is there? Kind of like the IPO stuff we're covering today. There's a lot more to it, but I want to give you enough to where you can go out for yourself. And I would encourage you to do this and see for yourself and do your own empirical research and prove it to yourself. All right. I don't think there's much in line of announcements. These might be a little old. Any questions, daviddavelander.com, and then lots of free stuff on my website, obviously. All right, let's go to live charts. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, you can start doing that now. If you have any questions outside of what we covered, feel free to ask now. So let me just get the charts set up real quick. Talk amongst yourselves. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the overall market real quick, and then we'll look at some sectors. And then obviously we'll drill down to your individual stocks, or we'll take a look at your individual stocks. All right, first of all, let's take a look at the S&P 500. One thing that I often preach about is persistency. And mathematically, persistency is equivalent to linear regression. But you know me, I like to keep things simple. So let's just put a linear regression line over the line I just drew. And you can see it's pretty darn close. In fact, if I'd have drawn the line a little higher, they'd be exact. So let's erase those for a second. Now, again, mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression, but I just like to draw a line through as many bars as possible. And you can see I'm intersecting most all of these bars. And then the ones that I'm not intersecting have daylight above this little line. OK. And if you, by the way, if you do think about the definition of a trend line drawing through the bars, it is mathematically equivalent to linear regression because you're trying that that bar that fits okay so just by drawing that line through the bars if you actually did the math on it and did it mechanically with the math it would come out to pretty much the same as intersecting all those bars hopefully that makes sense but i like to keep it simple i know some people like to use some stuff like linear regression it's kind of fun i've done this before i used to have on one of my older computers i used to have about 50 linear regression lines drawn on charts and that's kind of fun to play around with but you know just keep coming just come back to drawing your big blue arrows in the process now before i digress too far the the thing i wanted to tell you about linear regression and if you look on my website um you'll see that i recently did an article or updated an article i should say and actually freshened it up a little bit just yesterday so it's called uh, Why I Teach Trading and How It Benefits Both You and Me, or Me and You. And one of the things I talked about was being in front of a huge screen. In one case, I was in Italy, and it's like the bars were bigger than me, and I'm pretty big. That's why I have the nickname Big Dave. But seeing those huge bars... It's like it really jumps out at you on a chart. The patterns are just like, wow, it's just amazing. And one thing that I noticed was that I'm always preaching 20 days of persistency 
for something like a persistent pullback. But what amazed me, especially looking at something like a transitional pattern when a market's coming off a major low, is that short-term persistency could be very, 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 very powerful. Now, I'm no longer a, a short, short, short-term trader, and I no, I no longer do any programming, mechanically testing, but I do think that would be some fodder for research if somebody wants to go poke around a little bit. Look for short-term persistency in the market and then figure out a way to hop on board that short-term persistency. Maybe it could be as simple as just buy on after so many days of persistence, you know? I mean, it would take some money management and a few other things, but it's just amazing how powerful that is. So we have this very persistent move higher in the S&P 500, and it's just really, really cool. And if you get bored, go back in time and look at persistent moves like back here, as you can see in the S&P 500, back here. You know, you can see that some – Decent legs resulted after these short-term persistent moves. Now, before I forget, we are right at these all-time highs. I guess we have to go up a point or two today or close a point or two higher to keep us there or to put us back there. But as a trend follower, you never want to argue – with all time highs. And this is something that I've looked at empirically. And then it kind of comes back to the ABC pattern. If a market is, if the market's going to go here, right? It's going to have to go through a new high along the way. Make a new high, right? Gonna have to make quite a few new highs. So as long as it's at or near new highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. And keep in mind, as I often preach, and I think it's in the last post I put up, as more Greg Morris says, the market only makes new highs about four percent of the time. So it will consolidate quite a bit. But if it's consolidating and it's not too far from all-time highs, like right here, and your all-time highs somewhere in here then give it the benefit of the doubt. Don't be a hero. Don't rush out and call a top. And this, this bull market we're in now, I've seen people call a top over and over and over for the last several years, in fact, fighting the trend. It seems like every time it makes a new high, oh, it's a fifth of a third, a third of a fifth. The Fibonacci extension is uh, at 0.79 of the oscillator. This is the most overbought it's been in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Well, so what? Is it going up? Is it going down or is it going sideways? It's going up. Don't fight the trend, okay? So, again, we weren't too far from new highs right here. We made new highs here. Now we're making new highs or just off of new highs here. So if you're at or near new highs, err on the side of the longer-term trend. NASDAQ. Nice persistent trend higher. If we close where we are at this moment, 66.06, we will be at an all-time high. Don't argue with all-time highs. Pay attention. Nice persistent breakout. I've been moaning and groaning in the service all throughout this period and in the market in a minute too, saying that I sure would like to see us take out this high decisively. And we have so far so good. Now you might be thinking, hey, Dave, weren't you a little worried about a bear market over the summer? And I was because the market was losing momentum. We were beginning to see some sell signals. And it was probably time to pull in your horns a little bit, especially since the Russell 2000 bow tied down after going sideways for about a year. Now, we didn't go crazy bearish. In fact, the only short that we took actually happened once the market turned back up, just because we will take a setup in and of itself if we think it's worth taking. Of course, it failed miserably, but that's okay. We get paid to put capital in harm's way. And the reason I did the presentations, the 
Winter is Coming presentations was because I wanted to get ahead of it. It's kind of like the IPO thing. It's like, okay, well, let me get this course out here, out there before the IPO bull market ends. And luckily and fortunately, I know you should never say luck in this business, but fortunately, it's lasted for an extra three years. And then getting back to the winter is coming, I was like, at least want to show you what the signals look like. So when you see them again, and when they happen on a weekly basis, if you want to be extra careful, wait for that weekly confirmation on the downside before feeling like you're in a bear market or a potential bear market, at least you know what to look for. Now, take a look at the Russell. As you can see, Russell has, as I've been saying in the market in a minute and in the trading service, it has this flag look to it. And let's see if I can take the chart out if I forget which one it is. I know you've seen some indicators. Some of these indicators aren't mine. They just came with the package 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But a flag is just that. It looks like a little flag at the end of the pole. So you put the chart back in, you can see market ran up and it kind of made this little flag pattern, which is bullish. Now, I don't trade off a flag pattern, but I respect it. And I much rather a flag pattern than a wedge up. A wedge up is when a market drifts up. I think that's a lot more dangerous to get involved with. And that's actually bearish. If this were going upward, even though it's a little counterintuitive, it would actually be somewhat of a bearish pattern. Not that the market can't go higher after an upward wedge like that it's just it's a lot of, it's it's like the last of the buyers are coming in is what's happening and it's not a pattern that i consider tradable but it's like you might want to pull your horns in a little bit when you see that or at least wait until you see a little bit more confirmation wait until you start seeing some new highs with vigor now the cool thing about the russell is that it has accelerated higher as of late and it had this pretty good run from lows and it's kind of turned even higher in here as you can see if you draw a trend line below the lows and it's also been fairly persistent the other good thing is it had this year plus change base and as i preach the bigger the launch the bigger I'm sorry, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space. The only thing that has me concerned, yeah, keep the stock picks coming. I'll get to them in just a few minutes, I promise. I'll hurry. I'll get through this. The only thing that has me a little concerned is the Russell is a V-shaped recovery at high levels. And the only problem with that is by the time you get all the way back to your prior highs, you're already overbought. But so far, so good, and it's really behaving very nicely now. The Russell's been the rub for about a year or so, and now it's finally joining in the party. So that's certainly a good thing. Now let's take a look at a few areas and take a look at bonds. You see bonds have sold off fairly hard now, but they're wide and loose and sideways. So there's nothing to do there, but I do like to pay attention to bonds on occasion just because the market looks at everything or you need to look at everything when it comes to markets and factor it in so right now it looks like bonds are in a little bit of trouble probably a bow tie down if i had to guess yeah a little sloppy but it's there gap down recently so that means rates are rising not the end of the world as long as they rise in a fairly orderly manner and don't just go skyrocket up I think we'll be okay. And the absolute rates is not what's most important. You can't say, well, if it's above 5% or 4% or what is it? Was it now 1%? It goes to 2%, then the market's going to sell off. There's no absolute level to worry about. It's more of the delta in rates, the change, in other words. So if we see a big drop in bonds, even though rates are still like ridiculously low longer term, that could put fear into the market, fear of even higher rates. So as long as the market kind of grinds its way lower, the bonds that is, which means that rates are kind of grinding higher, then that could get absorbed into the overall market. And it's not going to make people think they need to rush into those 
interest-bearing instruments. So just keep an eye on bonds every now and then. Now, bonds going down actually can benefit, to some extent, the financials. Higher rates, I should say, benefits the financials. And as you can see, take a look at XLF. You've got a nice persistent move higher, and you are at brand new highs in here, or just off of brand new highs. And it is flagging a little bit, kind of like that Russell was. I'm bullish on the energies right now, not necessarily energies in general. I would prefer if they were taking out this high here, but you could see over the short to intermediate term, they've been in a really good persistent trend. And where I'm finding my opportunities is in stocks that are at low levels, coming off of low levels and forming these transitional patterns. So I like the energies right now. I especially like them because there are stocks that are, as I said, coming off these major lows, and I think they have a long way to go. And if they go back to their old highs, we're talking about three, four hundred percent moves or more in some cases. So I think the huge potential exists there. And hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully on some of these, a year from now, I'm going to be showing them as longer term trend following money management type examples. And that's the goal on every trade, obviously, is to make as much as possible and hopefully be in that position for a long, long time. Now, metals and mining are getting a little bit questionable in here, so I'm not a huge fan of going after these guys right now. I'd actually like to see new highs here. There's enough other stuff out there that's worthwhile, as you would expect, with the market at new highs or near new highs to go after. Most areas banging out new highs. Take a look at the semis. There's that persistency thing I talked about. In fact, look at this. I'm just kind of noticing it. And this is another one of why I teach things because it helps me to see even better. But notice how persistent this little move was when it broke out. And that was only a few days. And then pulls back. Nice little thrust higher. Nice persistent thrust higher if it closes where it is now. All-time highs. Oh, correction. 16-year highs. Close enough for government work. Most technology areas, again, looking pretty good at or near new highs. You can see software banging out new highs today. The list goes on and on. I won't bore you and go through all of them too late. What's interesting is the transports have been very persistent also. I think that's the word of the day, persistent. Let's get some tequila. Have a shot every time I say persistent, right? I could use some tequila today. <laughs> Is it airplane? I picked, the wrong, I picked the wrong week to give up sniffing glue. But you can see nice persistent move higher in transports, banging on new highs. We close up here. Obviously, we're going to be at new highs today, so that's a good thing. I don't require any sector to confirm what I'm seeing in the overall market. I look at everything, transports, semis, financials. The list goes on and on, everything, right? Some people think the financial should dovetail in. That's called Dow theory. Not a big fan of that, but I can't argue with the fact that, okay, I get it. If the transports are making new highs, that's certainly a good thing. So I factor that into my analysis. Drugs are kind of hanging around their old highs. They are drifting a little bit. This is that little bit of a wedge problem I talked about earlier, that little bit concerned, but not enough to rush out and short them. The good news here is you take a look at biotech, and biotech did just the opposite. They kind of drifted lower. So right now I'm bullish on the biotechs. And I'm liking the more speculative issues. I'm liking the IPO type of issues in biotech. Stuff like the AKCA, which I do have a position in. That's That looks pretty darn good. So quite a few issues there that are worth going after and I think that's some big I think there's some big opportunities there now all isn't great in the world there are some areas that look a little questionable like health services which imploded a few days ago I wouldn't rush out and short these guys and I wouldn't dump all the ones that you may own or if you own any I wouldn't dump them I should say but I'd be a little cautious 
there's so many other areas that are looking so great right now, offering up so much opportunities. This is the biggest my Landry list, my personal watch list has been probably in two or three years. And there's been a long, a lot of times where I've been boring the clients to death by saying, look, guys, I've got these one or two to look at. I'm not doing anything. I don't think you should do anything. And right now it's kind of like I like this one and I like this one. And these are going to be our official setups. But, hey, if you're looking for something else to do, take a look at this oil service. Take a look at this biotech. Take a look at this other stock. So there's a lot of opportunity out there right now. And there, there have been times where it's not like this. Market's chopping around. And everybody comes to the show and they're like, you don't like anything. You like Mikey. And I'll ask about the stocks. Like, don't like it. I guess I could talk about that one, James. Let's go ahead and open up for individual stocks. This was, uh, this was mentioned as an honorable mention. Again, an ancillary setup in my trading service uh, yesterday, or day before, I should say, as a TKO. And yes, I like it. Uh, I would enter above this high here, whatever that is. And then your stop goes in below the low. Traded in kind of a textbook fashion, maybe like 2015. And then low, stop goes in below the low. And then do the math on that, which is four points round numbers. And that would be your initial profit target. OK, entry minus stop, initial profit target. Add that to your entry. And then trail your stop one for one on the first or on, on when you first get into position. And after you get that initial profit target, let that stop widen out. That's pretty much the whole system, by the way. Donna wants to talk about ARLZ. That sounds like an IPO. Yeah, I like this one. It does have a little overhead supply, but you know what? If it made it all the way back to that overhead supply, then that would be a good problem to have. I need to pay attention. This is on my Landry list. I need to pay attention to my Landry list. So if you guys are in the service that are in here, don't ask about stocks on the Landry list. You can email me personally on those. But yeah, I like it. That's why I made the list. You got a big picture cup and handle. It's come off the lows nicely. Another one of these examples of these drugs and biotechs that are bottoming out that have potential in here. You can see longer term bow tie off of all time lows, thrust higher. The thrust is a very persistent and accelerating one. Persistent and accelerating one, followed by a nice little pullback. HV a little crazy. Okay, this is going to be a volatile stock. I mean, what's the most you could lose? $2. <laughs> Yeah, don't play that game. You get in a lot of trouble. But yeah, definitely know the devil that you're that you're dealing with here. But yeah, good eye on that one. And Donald, I don't I don't know if you're currently on a service or not, but you're picking a lot of service stocks, so knock it off. <laughs> no, it's okay. Good eye. K and D I. Isn't that candy? Um this is a little bit on the extreme side. It's not completely crazy, but it's a little extreme. It's doubled over a very short period of time, and now it's pulled back. HV is up about 90. So good eye on that one, Donald. Nice thrust higher. I would like to see a little bit more TKO type of move. You got a little TKO move here. But I think it's, it's borderline too dangerous, too risky to trade. So just no going in that that's actually a little crazy but it does look good i can't argue with you too much on that any more tx or andre yeah i put it on your momentum list but it's too uh no you got to jump here from five to ten a hundred percent and change overnight that's too crazy hv is 201 so don't put that in your momentum list it's too uh it's too wild and crazy even by Big Dave standards. Z Lab for Howard. Now, this is a little bit on the volatile side, but getting back to, let's just see the, in keeping with uh, the theme of today, let's just see where we are with the Dave light, okay? This is day one, obviously this is day two. The high, I'm sorry, the close was set on day two, so let's draw a line, draw a horizontal line. So that's the close, okay? So what are the rules? 
it has to close above that high, which it did right here. The low has to be greater than the moving average, which it is. So, yes, that would have been a buy on this day here. So, yeah, good eye on that one. Not yet on the service. What are you waiting for? <laughs> I have room for one more person. I'll save you a spot. BKI. Carlston. Now, this is a much higher price issue. And yes, it did make a buy. Uh, I'm sorry, a Dave Light buy. I, I would not buy it because the range isn't really that great for an IPO. You want to see some, some excitement in an IPO, IPO. Now, I know it's not quite apples to apples because of the, the pricing kind of throws things off a little bit. But you'll notice in something like the AKCA, the aforementioned AKCA, was like a 40% move or 50% move, whatever it was, over a very short period of time. And the range on some of those other buy at B's and Dave lights was 30, 40, 50%, whatever. It's that you had a really good range as opposed to something that comes out and makes a very small range. So there's some excitement or at least some fear and excitement, however you want to look at it, in those IPOs that trigger the pattern. Or, or let me rewind that. You want to see some excitement and fear in those patterns, some volatility, so to speak. So this is only has about 10% move since it came public. It doesn't mean it won't work or can't work, but it's kind of, uh, it hasn't really demonstrated huge volatility just yet. Huge. But yeah, I hear you. You would be long from 44.50 uh, with the pattern. So it's, it's nothing wrong with it other than it's just a little bit on a thin side. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the volatility isn't quite there yet, but it does look good. I mean, if you had the, if the chart, if the scaling was reduced a little bit, it wouldn't look as, as impressive. It's only because you've got, this is just four point move, which is substantial, I realize, but we like even crazier. Turn. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Lower price issue. Volume's fairly low, but not horribly bad. Yeah, maybe on pullbacks along the way. It's it looks like it was kind of like a thin penny-ish type stock for quite a while. It has made quite a substantial move over the last few days. So if it could keep this up and it's not just a one or two day wonder. It did pull back. It might be worth a shot. Could you do a case study on HMNY? Okay. Be happy to. It's going to be in what? Harmony? HMNY. <clears throat> now, obviously, this one, super duper crazy. One thing, if you want to get good at reading charts, then obviously look at a lot of charts. But as I preach, you want to practice deliberate practice, okay? So that means when you see a big move in a chart, you want to ask yourself, could I and should I have caught that big move? Now, this one's obviously a little crazy. You can see it shot up way back in 2016, like overnight doubled or something. So that's just, so we know we, we're dealing with something crazy. I'm not really seeing anything that jumps out at me in this one that would have necessarily got me long, at least not right away. If it was an IPO, yes, maybe. But it kind of made these moves somewhat overnight. And if you look here, it was up at $5 a share. And within a couple of days, it's down to $2 a share. So it lost like over half its value. So it's just so crazy. It's really hard to, to get on board something like that and, and have a setup. 
So as I say, unless you're, uh, what's his name, Weinstein? I guess, and he found out too, you know, as he painfully has discovered recently, you can't kiss all the women, you know? So sometimes you just have to let them go. In this particular case, it took off, and we really didn't have a good setup to jump on board. Now, there's been some crazy one lately where there, there have been some really good setups along the way. But this one, I really don't see it as, as one. And now it's too crazy. Even if it did set up, it would be tough. So look at the longer-term personality of something and see like it's all over the place. And don't feel like you should have caught a move that looks like this. Now, if there's something blatant, in it, if there's a blatant pattern, if there's like a beautiful TKO that sticks out like a sore thumb in the middle of a nice accelerating persistent uptrend and you missed it, then beat yourself up a little bit, but then get cut yourself some slack and say, okay, well, I missed it, but next time I will not miss that pattern because I see it in perfect hindsight and next time I'm going to see it when it occurs in real time. But yeah, there's, there's not always there's not always a pattern to get you in on everything. And I would encourage you not to try to find a pattern for everything because what's going to happen is, yeah, you might catch a HMNY and make a lot of money, but you're going to have another 100 trades that's going to nearly wipe you out. And by the time you get around to that HMNY, you'll be out of money if you trade everything, okay? You have to... You have to specialize. And my specialty is trend and, and mostly pullbacks. And with a little bit of IPOs using a lot of those, a lot of the stuff that carries over and only a small breakout characteristic. You want to do the same thing with OPNT? We can do that. That's going to be another crazy one, right? Now, this was a little bit cleaner in taking off in here, uh, but it's also too thin, okay? So that would have been too thin to trade. You can see average volume is just way, way thin. So it would have been dangerous. The problem with trading something thin is a couple things, but one thing, if you're, if you're a, a proponent of technical analysis, it's funny. It's like you go to – I go to these uh, – I haven't been in a, in a while. I've been too busy. But when I go to these American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meetings, it's not that I have these great epiphanies. I do lose – I do lose. I do use, learn some things that are new and interesting. But for the most part, it's kind of like stuff I knew but didn't realize exactly why. And one thing was like as somebody pointed out, I think it was Greg Morris. You always get something good out of Greg. Was that technical with technical analysis? Easy for me to say. You have to have a representative sample. You have to have enough people trading the stock to make it adhere to technicals. So this one's so thin, it just wouldn't qualify. And you could see it's just chopped around for years and years. Now it did eventually take off, so maybe you could. Say, okay, well, the volume picked up, the personality changed. But I'm really not seeing anything on this one either. So, again, you don't always – they don't always jump out at you as great setups. I mean, you did have a little bit of a knockout here, but it really wasn't enough to get that excited about. Was it like very or something? Let me show you something. Else. Like Now, see something like this, an IPO, a little bit different story because you had – you had setups and things that triggered back here, AKCA, another example, which I'm still long, by the way. You had IPO setups back here. You had enough volume to give you a representative sample for technical analysis. JBHT, it's going to be a trucker. It's not bad. Now, not bad doesn't equal good, but 
It's not bad. You could certainly do a lot worse. First thing jumps out at me, it's kind of just the opposite problem that we had with the Andre stocks. The Andre stocks tend to be HV of 500 or more. <laughs> The HV is 16 on this. If you let's take a look at the spiders real quick, just to give us a representative sample. I mean, uh, a baseline. The HV is seven in the spiders. Now, part of that problem. If that's the problem, you want to see it, see it as a problem. But part of the reason that it's dropped so low is because we have had a persistent movement here. Persistency will knock down the HV. And that's one of those little nuances, little thing that you just have to kind of file away. But if you get back to the JBHT, you've got an HV of 16, which is fairly low. I mean, if you take a look at some of these biotechs that we're looking at and these little all service stocks. Let's take a look at let's just take a look at one real quick. This is one I like a lot. Joan. That's got an HV of 97. Okay. Ten times more volatile than the overall market. Now you can't have too much of a good thing like Andre with his wild and crazy stocks, but it works for him. So I don't want to beat him up too much on that. But as a general statement, it's very dangerous with some of those. So I hear you. It's broken out. It's fairly persistent. It's pulled back. And it is nicely above the prior peak in here. So if the HV was higher, I would almost give you a high five on this. But the HV is kind of low, and it's not a hugely volatile stock. That whole move higher was what? Not even 10% higher move from the breakout? Let's measure that and see what we had. Okay. So that whole move on a closing basis was 9%. That's a 9% breakout followed by a pullback. And if you think about, if you look at some of the stocks that we participate in, like Chem, okay, let's see what we got here. Chem is going 29% in about a month, okay? So it gives you an idea of the difference in volatility. So the volatility too low on that one. I do like that one. Uh, I have been liking that one, Donald. And that's IPI. My only concern with this one now is that it has pulled back below its prior little peak in here. And it is a little wide and loose longer term. It's worked its way higher, but a little wide and loose. I think I'd pass on this one for now and see if there's something else out there. The other thing that has me concerned is that on a net net basis, it's gone two months and change. So now we take it off. Yeah, the more I look at it, the more I think it, it, it's not worth going after. So it's pulled back past its prior peak, and the net net move is kind of a uh, slow. LFG, I don't know if I can pull up uh, that. Let's see if I can just do LGF. LGF.P. Oh, there it is. Line gate. Longer term, I'm seeing a lot of problems with this stock. Obviously, you've got all this trading going way back here. And I don't have a definitive answer for how much and how far back. And it's something I spent a lot of time in the stock selection course talking about. It depends, okay? It's not. There's no quick answer I can give you. But it's had so much trading back here for so many years. you got to remember that markets have very long memories. So it's going to hit some overhead supply if it begins to hit new highs. The HV also pretty low on this one at 22. And it just hasn't really made that huge of a trend. It's okay. I think you could probably do a little better out there, especially given the conditions in the current market. So a little choppy, HV a little low, and just way too much overhead supply, even though that overhead supply is a long ways, ways away. I mean, ways away time-wise. GDI. This one looks okay. 
I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback. It is a little, well, it's a little thin today, but it's okay. It's got decent volume. I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback. We must have talked about this one last week. You've got a nice persistent breakout. It's also a toddler. It's a relatively new issue. It's finally beginning to move. The HV is a tiny bit low, but not bad. So I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback. Now, here's where you could bend the rules a little bit with IPOs. You could be a little bit more lenient. So you could say, well, I know it didn't pull back a lot as deep as Dave would like, but it is an IPO. There is some possible excitement with it. So I think it'd be okay to go after. And then your entry would be somewhere above this little pivot high. It's what I call a trend pivot pullback. And then maybe have a uh, stop down here or something. You can probably get away with with two or three points on stop. The only problem is the money management would have you buy a lot of shares. And so that's kind of you're kind of getting into the problem of lower volatility stocks with more risk. So it looks okay. Again, I'd like to see a stock that would have had a little bit bigger move to it because this move from here to here is only three points. That's not that much. I guess the more I look at it, the more I think I would pass just because it's lower in volatility and your money management wouldn't work just right. You could certainly do worse. Maybe if it knocks out a little bit more, it'd be worth a shot. But your range still isn't that great, again, with that low volatility. DCPH on Friday. You mean tomorrow or last Friday? Yeah. Now, this is this is going to be a little crazy. And it's a little bit on the thin side. Let's see if we can see what the volume is on this thing. Yeah, it's got enough volume to trade, but it would be very dangerous because you don't know what the volume is. A little bit on the crazy side, but not too bad. We'll take that back. It's not it's not too bad. Um Let's throw the moving average in and see. If you're trading a Dave light, obviously you'd have to get above the moving average. Yeah, put that on your watch list. I think that's worthwhile. A little risky, but worthwhile. CETV, that's going to be like a Central America something. Central Europe. A little on the thin side, not too, too bad. Uh... Yeah, I'll see if it keeps breaking out, maybe on a pullback, but not on a breakout, obviously. That's kind of crazy longer term. Twos, T-U-E-S. Oops. Well, the first thing jumps out at me is you have this gap here followed by quite a bit of overhead supply. So I would immediately pass on that one. And if you have time, if you have an hour to spare, it might even be a little bit longer than that. But go to my website on the stock selection page and pull up the... Uh, I'll go to store, click on the stock selection. There's a video on the, on the stock selection page where I talk about overhead supply. There's quite a few simple things in that, in that initial video, and, and that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. The other 13 and a half hours is just details. <laughs> CIFS, C-I-F-S, we talk about that one? Yeah, this is one that had a breakout characteristic to it. A little crazy now, but on a pullback, absolutely. If we put in the Dave Light pattern, you'll see that it had a really nice breakout. The range was a little tight, but but decent. And you could see that like right on that day there. 
Is that what we talked about earlier? But yeah, now in a pullback, absolutely. Put that on your momentum list. It's on mine. That's the other thing, too. It's like there's so many opportunities out there. It's like you can't kiss all the women. It's like it kind of it's kind of painful to watch some of these opportunities take off without you. CXLT. I think you gotta. I think you have a little uh, a mild flare up of uh, what do you call that? I'm so brain dead today. Dyslexia is what I think I'm looking for. <laughs> what is it? The, the uh, you hear about the dyslexic insomniac agnostic? He stayed up all night. I wonder if there was a dog. Um, this might be worth putting on your momentum list. It's not set up at the moment. It would have to break out a little bit more and then pull back to be worthwhile. Donald, that one's on the Landry list, too. In fact, that's a setup for today. High five to you. Good job. He's thinking, Dave, I don't need the service. I already know what the setups are. It's like, yeah, you might miss one every now and then. It might be worthwhile. <laughs> SSTI is also, oops, rewind that. That stock, whatever that stock was, not the stock I just mentioned, on the landry list. So you caught me at a, uh, you're getting my landry list somewhere. <laughs> yes, indeed, I have missed a few. Well, well, here's the way I look at it. This is what I preach to people. It's like a lot of times, in fact, sometimes I can be frustrated with me, especially if I help somebody a lot. And after about a year, they're like, hey, Dave, I got it. I want to go on my own. It's like, well, no, 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 keep me on staff. You know, just <laughs> it would be great. If I had somebody that did the same exact thing as me, I'd keep them on staff just to have an extra set of eyes looking at stuff, you know? Absolutely. Like, treat me like an institutional client does. You're welcome, Donald. Donald says you're a great teacher. Thank you, Donald. I wasn't fishing, but I'll take it. VKTX. Yeah, this is an interesting one. It's certainly been catching my eye as of late. Um, I do like stocks that come down, bottom out, make these huge bases at low levels, and then begin to take off. I call it a Phoenix type of stock. It really hasn't given you much time to get on. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Put that one on your list. Okay. It uh, looks like uh, – let me give it uh, – let me get last round here real quick. You know, I said bow tie a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. It's not necessarily jumping out of me. It's something that would have necessarily been taken, though. But I hear you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. As usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything and answer, daviddavelander.com. And if we don't talk to you now and then, I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.